She inspires us to leap over tall obstacles in a single bound. <laughs> Stephanie made so many positive contributions, she deserves to be recognized. So at this time, we'd like to recognize Stephanie Garibrand Sierra and congratulate her on one year anniversary with the city. And we all look forward to working with you for many years to come. Sure, sure. on your year there, Stephanie. Thank you. Pu public communications. The council welcomes participation in its meetings. Comments shall be limited to three minutes per person so that everyone may be given an opportunity to be heard. To expedite matters and avoid repetition whenever any group of persons wishes to address the council on the same subject matter, the mayor may request that a spokesperson be chosen by the group. This item is limited to matters under the jurisdiction of the city council, which are not on the posted agenda. Public criticism of the city council, commissions, boards, agencies will not be prohibited, but no action will be taken. At this point, is there anybody from the public that would like to come up and speak? On matters not on the agenda today. All right, going, going, gone. Thank you very much. All right, public matters. Presentation and proclamation of Project Sanctuary declaring April as Sexual Assault Awareness Month. And we have uh, Lydia Lopez and Matthew Alanis here who are board members, I believe. Uh, I don't know the board. Oh, okay. You know, I'm going to read it out here, and then I'm going to come down and present it down there just so that uh, we capture it on the, uh, there. A proclamation of the Willett City Council recognizing the month of April as Sexual Assault Awareness Month. <coughs> Whereas Sexual Assault Awareness Month is intended to draw attention to the fact that sexual violence is widespread and has public health implications for every community member of the city of Willits, and whereas Project Sanctuary is a domestic violence and rape crisis center serving victims of sexual assault and domestic violence in Mendocino County, including community members of the city of Willits, and whereas rape, sexual assault, sexual harassment impact our community as seen by statistics indicating that one in five women will have experienced sexual assault by the time they complete college, Fisher, Cullen, and Turner, 2000, I guess that's the citation, and whereas we must work together to educate our community about what can be done to prevent sexual assault and how to support the survivors, and whereas staff and volunteers at Project Sanctuary encourage every person to speak out when witnessing acts of violence, however small, and whereas with leadership, dedication, and encouragement, there is compelling evidence that we can be successful in reducing sexual violence in the city of Willits through prevention, education, increased awareness, and holding perpetrators who commit acts of violence responsible for their actions. And whereas the city of Willits strongly supports the efforts of national, state, and local partners and every citizen to actively engage in public and private efforts, including conversations about what sexual violence is, how to prevent it, and how to help survivors connect with services, and how every segment of our society can work together to better address sexual violence. Now, therefore, be resolved that we, the City Council of the City of Willits, join Project Sanctuary in the belief that all community members must be part of the solution to end sexual violence, along with the United States government and the State of California. Now, therefore, I, Gerardo Gonzalez, Mayor of the City of Willits, do hereby proclaim, proclaim April as Sexual Assault Awareness Month. And I just have in witness thereof, I have here on to set by hand, cause the seal of the city of Willits to be affixed on this 27th day of March, 2019. I'm going to come over here and present it to you folks. And as the uh, former police chief, I took advantage of the services you guys provided with that, so I'm really happy to work with you guys. So. Thank you. say that on the behalf of the board, our staff members, volunteers, and of course the victims that we service, we'd like to thank the council for its support during this critical month and the population as well. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you for your work. And under public matters, apparently we had item B has been pulled. Apparently there's a, they're working on that. That was the MTA bus stop on Alter Court. Um, I'd actually like to ask the, um, the deputy city manager to explain why that item was pulled. <laughs> yes, um, actually both the mayor and I called Carla Myers, the um, manager of uh, MTA, and asked if they were going to have a representative at tonight's meeting. And she said yes. We talked a little bit about what was going on. She said they had received several phone calls. I said, as, as has the city. And um, she decided to come on up here and see what was going on. And she went to the bus stop. She was not pleased at all with what she saw. And she showed up at our doorstep mid-afternoon and said, can we pull this from the agenda? Because this is not done correctly. I need to discuss it with my staff. She needs to talk to the city. And so right now, it's completely on hold. And did she, she apparently, according to what you told me, she had also engaged with the Yes, she talked Lewis's. to the Lewis's. Okay. They had a very lengthy conversation about it being there, and they expressed a whole bunch of concerns. <coughs> Excuse me. And she was actually quite cute because she, they talked about things that we never even thought of. So that's what's happening with this right now. So we'll bring it back, hopefully not to us, but bring it back with MTA probably the end of April Great. and figure out where that's going to be placed. And, and her sincere hope was that... Um, and she felt that it could be worked out after discussions with the neighbors. Um, it can be worked out, and it will not have to come back here. <laughs> All right. So now we go to item 3C, discussion regarding the operating hours of Mendocino County Museum. So we have our um, supervisor rep. But um, yes, and this is uh, last week, um, Supervisor Hashak came and uh, announced that the library was considering uh, I'm sorry, the museum was considering um, changing their hours, and he told us a little bit about that. And in response, council wanted to agendize that so they could discuss that. And so we did that. Um, there is no report presented because there really isn't more than what was presented. Um, but I, it does give us a chance to actually discuss the issue and ask questions of, of the supervisor or if he has any other news to share. John, would you like to come up and... Thank you. I'm John Haschak, 3rd District Supervisor. And I'd just like to say, um, Lydia Lopez, I'm so proud of her because she was a student of mine in <laughs> high school. And she's doing great work still. So <clears throat> that's really nice to see. Um, yeah, I brought this up because it was brought. Karen Horner, who's the director of the Cultural Services Agency, which oversees the museum, the library, and the parks, is here too. And um, it got brought up to the board, as I said last time, um, and I wanted to make sure that you were aware of it. I'm glad that you put it on the agenda to, so that you could discuss it, to give me and the rest of the Board of Supervisors some direction, because I think that the museum is a critical part of Willett's life, um, as well as the county. And I've heard from lots of people who were concerned and against the move of closing it on Sundays as um, since it was in the paper and I appreciate that coverage in the paper too um, but when I looked at the the surveys and the data that Karen Horner presented me um, it showed that when it was asked of people you know do you want to close would you rather close the museum on Sunday or or have would you rather have it open on Sunday or have it open on a weeknight 84% of the respondents to the survey said that they'd rather have it open on Sunday. And I, um, I checked with the other counties around here, Lake, Sonoma, Humboldt, all of their county museums are open on Sunday. Um, and, and like I said before, Sunday was the second highest total of attendees when we look at the whole week. And I just think that... Um, it's, that's information to consider. And do we want to open it up earlier in the morning at 9 o'clock, which is, would be the shift, you know, 
would shift to open at 9 o'clock, I believe, and um, stay open later one, one day a week, or do you want the, um, the museum open on Sunday? So that's what's before us, and I appreciate your consideration. Well, I, I talked to the supervisor Hashek about my thoughts because I did serve on the museum advisory board and, and do use the museum. And my thoughts were that I definitely would like to see it open on a Sunday, particularly during the summer months. Uh, that if it was there was a need, um, and it sounded like the need had something had a, a relationship to education and maybe schooling that maybe a compromise could be made that during the winter months we would have you know this one or two nights that we were open late but during those summer months during the peak of the season when people use the museum that the museum would be open on Sunday when I go to visit another community I always visit their museum and it's often on a Saturday or a Sunday and so I think it would be a great loss to our community to have the museum closed particularly during the summer months um, I appreciate you bringing this to our attention. When you first brought it up, I, I wasn't all that concerned about it. Um, I have a Main Street store, and we decided about two years ago to close on Sundays because it was our slowest day. Um, and I know a lot of other retailers who are closed on Sunday, and so I thought, well, that makes sense. Well, it's a sleepy on Sundays. But when I started talking to people in the community, they largely said, we want it to be open on Sunday. It matters. It matters to the community to feel like our county museum is here and open for visitors and residents alike. So I've come around on this, and I think that to represent the people of Willits, I think we really should um, strongly urge the museum to keep the Sunday hours, and I think that would best serve our community. Yeah, Jerry. Uh, I think so also because if you're a working person and you have a family and you want to go to that, Sunday's a one day that pretty much that everybody has the day off. And so consequently, I just thought that it was really a poor move if that's what the supervisors wanted to do, and I'm glad that it changed and, and it's open Sunday now. Thank you very much. I agree. I think uh, it's an important day for families to go to the museum and, and for visitors from out of town as well. People come on the weekends even during the winter as well, but not just summer. But I think it would be better to um, have it stay open on Sundays. And maybe you can adjust the hours somehow so that there can be an evening uh, hour someplace long during the week. But um, you know, I understand budget is always a big deal, but it seems like the wrong place to cut is to, to reduce the hours on Sunday. So. Being the last guy here to speak, I kind of agree with my fellow council members. So. There's a lot of history in there. I gotta tell you, my first hearse was uh, what I saw when I was a kid in there. <laughs> I uh, like the um, the creamery exhibit they have in there. I mean, I remember going to the original creamery. So one of these days, maybe they'll stuff me and put me in there too. So maybe I'll <laughs> there on a Sunday. Uh, <laughs> so so that's my two cents, John. Is that uh, I agree with uh, my fellow council members. That, and thank you again for bringing this to us. And I just want to make sure that you're clear on the process, as far as I understand it, is that it was presented to the Board of Supervisors, and the Board sent it back because there hadn't been, it hadn't gone properly through the Museum Advisory Board. And so the next Museum Advisory Board that regularly scheduled is, I think, May 13th? Second month in May. Second yeah. month. And, um, but there might be a special meeting before then to reconsider this, to pass it by through that channel. So, you then need it a will, letter from from us. Uh, would, would you need something like that? I think that would be very appropriate and helpful. Yeah. I well, first of all, I'd like to. Do we need a motion that we would send a letter and well, to you have can, a motion? You can direct me to draft a letter okay. for you. Okay. Yeah. I would direct the manager to draft a letter that Jerry could sign to. But the other thing is that um, Sabrina was on the board for a uh, museum advisory board for at least a year, and I was on for a year or two. I think I was on for two years, maybe even three. Um, but we don't currently have a representative on that board, and as far as I know, we don't. Um, maybe we should appoint somebody, at least for this particular month. <laughs> I just want to 
want to make a quick comment before we maybe respond to it. I just want to say thank you for pointing out the fact that the Museum Advisory Board was not consulted and hasn't had an opportunity to weigh in. Because one of my frustrations in having served on that, anytime you give up your time on a community uh, board, you want to know that the input that you're giving is, is worth something. Nobody wants to sit there and, and rubber stamp. And the fact that prior to the supervisors hearing about this, that the advisory board didn't have an opportunity is discouraging that things still haven't changed. And uh, I, I hope that uh, I hope that the supervisors will, will change that and uh, put some value in the in the uh, the boards that, uh, that they ask people to give their time. We need to show that it's appreciated by at least listening to what they have to say. So thank you. Okay, so I guess a few more by consensus. I, 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 uh, we should make sure we've opened it up to the public. Yeah. Okay. Anybody like to, from the public like to speak on it to this? <clears throat> so thank you. I'm Karen Horner, the Cultural Services Agency Director and County Librarian. And I just want to clarify something, and I apologize for the past doctor, if there was some misunderstanding. The Museum Advisory Board was discussed about the hours. I just want to clarify that they were aware of the survey, and we did meet and talk about it. Um, there just wasn't a quorum present, so it wasn't a a considered official meeting, but it was brought to their attention, and we were just—they discussed the hours with us, and they were open to the idea of changing it, and that's what was presented to the board was just the concept of changing it, and the reasons behind the change. It, it, no way to impact Willits whatsoever. We want to improve the museum, and it was just uh, working with the staff resources that we have, and trying to find ways to increase visitation because really we're getting 2,000 visitors um, a year at the museum. And, um, you know, the Willits Library gets 7,000 people a month. So how do we get those 7,000 people that come next door go to the museum? And um, what was determined is that Sundays weren't visited individually. Sundays were really, really low. It's when there's special events in Willits, the Roots of the Motor Power have their special events, where we get the big influx of visitors. And um, it was very clear with the Museum Advisory Board, we would be open on open to being open on Sundays for any city or Roots of Mona Power event. So it was mainly just to address the law, like the winter time, our issues in that, but we would definitely be willing to be open. And I'm open to a dialogue definitely with the city of Willits in terms of options. I, I like the idea of maybe being open during the, the summer months and closing. We're just trying to find ways to increase more people to come. And nighttime, maybe getting people in different parts of the county to come visit. You know, people that come to dinner, maybe have a special event once a week. Um, so that was the reason behind the hour. I just want to clarify the reason for it. Was we're just really trying to increase tours, um, people coming to visit the museum. And the thought for opening earlier was to make it easier for schools to visit because we wanted to be that educational um, stop for everybody to come. So, uh, but yes, we're open to trying anything, new and different, just to entice people to come. But I'll definitely take take what the, the city council has um, recommended and um, go back to the drawing board and come up with maybe a different option of hours and choices of what we can. <clears throat> Thank so. you, Karen, for coming. Yeah. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I was just see if anybody else wanted to speak to this. I guess not, so. Um, and just to clarify, um, I'm going to write a letter for the mayor's signature um, supporting keeping the museum open on Sundays. Um, would you like me to put anything else in there as in in the future when when these things are discussed that the city the uh, the city council be maybe addressed and so that we can chat about it before the decision and if nothing else just you know, you know the more you meet and get the word out the, sometimes that <coughs> becomes your press that sometimes that's the fact that we're discussing it I'm sure now it's going to get googled by somebody <laughs> and all of a sudden now it shows up in a search. I've learned this now and so, it, well that's the thing is that so sometimes the controversy has a tendency to to, to bring up your uh, tenants, I don't know. But um, having that dialogue, is, you know, and what we can do on our end would be important too. So, but thank you. All right. I think Matt brought up a point that you want to discuss. Do we want to try to have a representative on the Museum Advisory Board as we have in the past. Do I have any volunteers? I'd be interested. Okay. That would be great. We, we <coughs> desperately would like a city village representative. Great. Thank you. Thank you. 
I, yeah, we'll I talked at length with uh, Brent Walker uh, last week about it, so I think that it could be a good fit. Thank you, Greta. Yeah. So if you could send the city stuff so we can get it to Greta. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greta. Thank you for coming tonight. All right. So now we are at the <coughs> no enactment of ordinances, so we're on number five, consent calendar. And matters listed under the consent calendar are considered to be routine by city council and will be enacted by single motion and roll call vote by the city council. Items may be removed from the consent calendar upon request of the council members and acted upon separately by the city council. Does anybody want to pull anything? Do I have a motion on the consent calendar? I, I recommend that we approve the calendar. I'll second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion up here? Any discussion from the public? All right, call for the vote there. Councilmember Cronin? Yes. Rodriguez? Yes. Strong? Yes. Strass? Yes. Mary Gonzalez? Yes. Thank you. Informational reports. Guess we have a right to appeal, <coughs> item seven. Persons who are dissatisfied with the decisions of the City Council may have the right to a review of that decision by court. The City has adopted Section 1094.6 of the Code of Civil Procedure, which generally limits to 90 days the time within which decisions of the City Boards and agencies may be judicially challenged. Commissions and agencies, the Willett City Council meets concurrently as well as Planning Commission, and I don't think we have successor agency, I don't think we have anything there, so... City manager reports. Okay, I, I just have a few things. Um, first, I wanted to thank this wonderful staff at Willits uh, again, now that I've composed myself a little bit. Um, but again, thank you very much. And again, it's, it's, an, it's an honor to be here. And this is a fabulous staff that works their hearts out. And this city is, is really lucky to have each and every one of the, the staff members here. And, it's they're lovely, lovely to work with. Thank you. A um, couple <coughs> things. Uh, the road, the um, folks at Frontier Days uh, came by to notify us that they are doing a concert at the rodeo grounds with uh, a pretty famous person named Ned Ledoux oh. on September 21st. And um, they were cons they were wondering whether it's whether it's whether it was okay if they played till if he played till midnight at the rodeo grounds, and was wondering if there was any requirements for permission. And we actually have no rules against that. Uh, we do at the park. It's a, it closes at ten. However, the rodeo grounds does not. We have no noise ordinance for the rest of the city. Um, so there were. So that's what they're going to do, <laughs> is they're going to play until midnight. Uh, Ned Ledoux, get your tickets from Brown Paper Tickets. They're $25 a piece. Should be a fabulous concert. Is it Ned or Chris Ledoux? It's Ned. It's his son. Oh. The 26th? It's the 21st, September 21st. Oh. I just wanted to mention that for the past two years, that has also been Peace Day, International Peace Day. Oh. Um, so... Uh, the people that were, I, I, it hasn't come up in any of the meetings I've been to recently, but I'm pretty sure there, it's an every year thing. But maybe, maybe locally we could do it on a different day. We could do it on the 20th or something. Because it sounds like that's pretty solid. At the rodeo grounds, yes. They've, yeah. they've, and we wouldn't uh, he's, wanna... he's booked, and it's, uh, and what he's really get? expensive. We, we would not want to conflict <laughs> with that. <laughs> he's, a, he's the biggest active will it says he for a while. Also, last year we did it in the afternoon, as I'm calling. Okay. So that yeah, might... This is going to be an evening. <clears throat> okay, just what, one what is the date again? Uh, September 21st. And I'm not sure what day of the week that is. Saturday. Saturday night. Saturday. It's an okay. equinox. Imagine, is Peace Day using Red Grove again this year at the high school? I don't know. They, it hasn't, as I said, I, I usually hear about it from somebody, um, but I haven't heard anything yet. And it's still early. It is still early, but it's but good planning, to think about. Yeah, that. They plan all it was time. last year, it was at Red Grove. I think they started, and some kids from the high school walked over there. Anyway, we'll, I will uh, put that out and let people know that. Okay. Um, Plan ahead. We were notifying folks that we wanted to do flushing, and we kept saying, flushing is coming, flushing is coming, flushing is here. Uh, the water department completed the Hell Creek uh, subdivision flushing on Tuesday. Next is the Bechtel Road Shell Lane area uh, this Friday. Um, and we're going to update, uh, you know, our website's getting updated because we were sort of on hold with the rain and all that. 
Um, Harris Manor subdivision is scheduled for next Tuesday, followed by Walker Road area on Wednesday or Thursday. And the Main Street flushing will take place the second week in April, starting at 8.30 p.m. on Tuesday the 9th, Wednesday the 10th, and Thursday the 11th, usually finishing up about 3 a.m. each evening. It happens in the evening. Um, we will be giving hand giving notices to all the businesses in Main Street um, starting next Monday uh, to give everybody a week's notice that they're, we're going to be in their area because we really want to make sure that everybody on Main Street knows that this is happening on their businesses. So, um, Just ask, uh, does that mean people should expect maybe the water's going to look a little different? The water's going to look a little different. It's perfectly safe. It is absolutely clean. There is nothing wrong with your water. There will be just be a little bit of a discoloration at times. Um, but it's nothing to be afraid. Uh, nothing to be afraid of. <laughs> Turbidity, they call it. Turbidity. I think that is what Scott Herman has fancy words for that. Yes. Thank yes. you. Just thought people should know that. Uh, thank you. <coughs> uh, music in the park. The planning stages are coming along nicely. That's going to be April 28th. It's an all-day Sunday festival-style uh, concert. Um, the confirmed band so far are Lifted Spirits, One Grass, Two Grass. Sam Chase and the West Nile Ramblers. Uh, this is a free event and we are still looking for sponsors and vendors and uh, it's going to be a fun day at the park. Um, we have, I, I really am asking people to get the word out uh, on April 24th, PG&E is going to come and talk to us about planned outages. Um, so important for people to know about this. Um, it's been in the paper, it's on our website, we're trying to get people to know about this presentation. And um, very important, pg is going to come give that presentation on April 24th. Uh, pardon? He works for pg and He's up and down twice and down once. Oh. He won't vilify him, he's just here as an expectator. Okay. <laughs> um, lastly, uh, I will be on vacation um, from the 8th to the 15th of April. Um, and we'll be out on some medical, doing some medical things next week on the 3rd and the 4th and possibly the 5th. Um, I will be doing my annual pilgrimage to the Old Settlers Music Festival in Texas. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kathy uh, will be the uh, acting city manager in my absence and will do a fabulous job in conducting uh, the meeting, the first meeting in April. So that's all I got. Department recommendations. Administration. Public safety. Chiefs. So, uh, as many of you recall, last year about this time, a uh, van load family went over the, uh, into the ocean on the coast, the Hart family. Uh, April 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and possibly 5th, there's going to be a coroner's inquest at the Willits Justice Center. Um, they will likely be picking a jury in Ukiah on the 2nd, and then um, they will be conducting the inquest. It's a public inquest. They're going to try to stream uh, <coughs> the rest of that week. And one of the reasons I bring this up is because we expect a lot of media here. Also, a lot of people have been uh, curious as to why there's been a beautification of the Willits Justice Center. Uh, they've replaced tan bark. They've painted the outside. They've added a light to our flag. Um, today, the sheriff added a uh, Sheriff's Department sticker to our front door. They painted, they replaced all the ceiling tiles in the courthouse and in the upstairs and painted the courthouse, painted the bathrooms, painted the upstairs um, in, in preparation uh, of this uh, several day event. Um, so if people were curious about that. And, uh, Oh, oh, yeah. The, one of the main things is the uh, the county is removing our sandbags station from the side of the building. So uh, our community will not, during the time that those are gone, will not have access to sandbags or sand. 
So, uh, and incidentally, the police department's the only uh, occupant of that building, and we rent it from the county. And we've been trying for years to get our ceiling tiles replaced. I counted 48 today that are damaged by the rain uh, and other things. And we've tried, we've asked them to paint the police department, replace carpets, put hot water in the dispatcher's bathroom, which there, there is none. Um, yet when they have this, I sh probably should not do this, but <laughs> they're having this event, suddenly it, it, it's got to be spruced up for the media. So, I'm sorry, did you have a uh, comment? Okay. No, good question. Yes. Did they replace the ceiling tiles in the uh, strafe room for the police? No, no, there's 48 tiles in the police department that need replacement, but, and but we, we had put requests in and requests in. But the rest of them were, were replaced, just not the they, they were replaced in the courthouse that they're going to use for three days and upstairs, so the media will see a nice, clean justice center for the county. Um, so there, there's going to be limited parking for anybody who wants to come over here. There's, they expect a lot of media uh, at the event. There was another thing I was going to say. Um, oh, they, they haven't had a coroner's inquest in this county, as far as I know, for the last 60 years, but they, but they decided it was, uh, in our, the coroner, the sheriff coroner, decided it was important to uh, put all the facts out in front of the public, which I kind of agree with. And will the, the, now there's a sheriff's emblem on our front door, will that stay, or? No, the, the sheriff called me today, and um, apparently somebody told him I was not happy with that. Um, and he said, oh, it's just going to be up for the inquest, and we're going to take it off after the inquest. It's a shame that our um, supervisor, uh, Mr. Hastrick, is no longer Yeah, there. I was hoping he was going to stay. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. Matt, did you have well, I was just wondering if we, <clears throat> if the police department has requested uh, things, maintenance for a building that we're the renter of and they own, and so they're the landlord. They're supposed to be responsible for that kind of stuff. Um, do we do we need to reinforce? Well, I just put another request in today for all those things. Can you keep us up to date whether they respond? <clears throat> I will. Thank you. And I, I believe uh, Mayor Gonzalez was dealing with all those issues prior to retiring as well. So uh, I'm not sure everybody knows that the county owns the Justice Center mm -hmm. and the, the city owns the like, dirt that it sits on. <coughs> and uh, there's a, an agreement by which uh, the city has been paying rent since uh, the 70s, I think, or 1985 or something. 88. <laughs> and two years, uh, I think it used to be $35,000 twice a year. In 2017, the rent was reduced to $1 a year for the city for the next 40 years. And so the, the county is um, not receiving any, any rent any longer, and coincidentally, they're not to responding to um, requests to improve the lease. Well, all, all defense to the county, they weren't doing it before we were paying all the rents. <laughs> So the good news is we have nominal rent. <laughs> All right. No other question? All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, Karen, you're going to have something later on. But Chris, do you have something? All is well. Okay. Oh, I have something. Do you have something? Okay. So I wanted to let everybody know that um, we are going to have, we are going to celebrate Dispatcher Week, which is April 14th. And uh, we're going to celebrate our dispatchers and our community service officers. And it'll go through April 20th. Uh, we're going to invite the public to, you know, stop by and thank a dispatcher today. <laughs> uh, we will be celebrating them each and every week because they do provide a lot of service, not only to the community, because they're there, they're the voice we never meet, um, but they also uh, keep our firefighters and our police officers safe. And... Uh, making sure that they get where they need to go. So I wanted to let you know that we'll be bringing something to the next council in regards to that. Thank you. Okay. Do 
Suzanne, do you have anything? Uh, well, she has anything. an item. I know you have an item, but do you have anything else you want to speak? All right. Well, I guess we're done with department recommendations. So I guess at this point. We have some items. Yeah, yeah, item 10A, staff seeks direction for the possible adoption of energy management plan. So you're up. the packet that you got with the plan had some bad numbers in it which have been corrected and so you should have the correct version in front of you. I think it's just the paper one. So I apologize for that. Um, so uh, last year during the council goal setting session it was brought to staff's attention that a priority a fairly high priority it seemed at least at the time was to develop an energy management plan and so we kind of um, got all the goals and and found out what your priorities were those of you who were here and then went back I went back to my desk and I went what the heck is that <laughs> and so I did some research um, and basically found out that it can be a lot of different things. Um, and so what I've put together for you to look at is basically what I think is something that we could handle. Um, but maybe even barely. <laughs> Um, it has five main components to it. Um, one is conducting energy audits on our buildings and our pumps. Um, another part is reviewing our energy bills for errors and strange anomalies that could be there. Um, another part is checking that the maintenance of our equipment is, is on schedule and um, Fourth is um, having a, um, writing an RFP and looking at a feasibility study for renewable energy projects in town. Um, the one project that stands out, and I know the city has kind of been interested in this before, is looking at renewable energy projects that would offset the energy costs. Um, at our wastewater treatment plant, and that's namely because we already have solar up at our water treatment plant, and um, the wastewater treatment plant is the second highest user, if not the first highest user. They're, they're comparable, the two plants. And then the fifth part is actually constructing the capital improvement plans that the audits or the feasibility study might suggest would be beneficial to the city. Um, so, since I wrote this, uh, I've talked to June, our financial director, who was here, <laughs> um, and she has informed me that she had a pretty good experience when she was working for the city of Rio Vista, I believe, and working with consultants that were free, actually. It was a federal energy efficiency um, funding source um, that she she had experience with consultants who did actually most parts of this plan, so that's kind of exciting <laughs> to know that. Um, so I put the plan together. It's kind of a lot of tables, so I hope it didn't overwhelm people. I know it certainly could. Um, but basically what I was trying to show you are what I think are some essential elements in a plan. Um, and also give me an idea of what kind of staff time that could take to implement that plan. But I did want to let you guys know that there is a possibility that we could get consultants on board for free to do several of the different components that I've outlined in the plan. For example, I do have someone in mind that I've been talking to and I've been waiting to, to speak with you. 
um, about reviewing our bills, and it's actually a company, they do it for free, and the savings that they find, we split with them for three years, so already the staff time could be cut down if we decide to move forward with this idea. Um, but I really, going into this kind of project, I didn't know what council wanted. <laughs> I knew that you wanted an energy management plan, <laughs> um, but I didn't really have much more direction than that. So tonight, I really would like to get some guidance. I've proposed what's in front of you, um, and I'm hoping that I could get some direction and maybe you just like it and you say, yes, do it, do all of that, and then I can, can do that for you. Um, I think it's important just to reiterate <laughs> that we have a lot of projects going on. We're, we're busy. Our office is busy. This would probably fall mostly on me. Um, I certainly can do this and work on this. It just means that other things will not happen as quickly as maybe we want them to. Um, if I can get consultants on board, then I think that could be a real win because it would be kind of minimal time on our end and hopefully we would get benefit and see what kinds of energy efficiency or renewable energy projects that we we could implement that would be beneficial and then kind of come back and see what our choices are and, and have a, a different discussion about that. So um, the, the, the plan is broken up into three sections. It's basically action items and then it's kind of a cost breakdown, what I thought it would cost in dollars <laughs> in staff time. Um, and then it kind of summarizes why those elements are important. That's how it's supposed to be broken down. Um, so I hope you got that out of it. But at this point, I, I, I would like some feedback on, on what you guys think and about what I put forward. Oh, sure. Um, okay, so I obviously wasn't here when this was um, declared a, um, a concern, um, but it is definitely one that I share, and I think having an energy management plan for the city is important, um, not only because it's the right thing to do for the environment, but it also has the potential to save the city money and codify our behaviors and procedures citywide that have an impact on energy usage. Um, personally, I'm more interested in small changes that we can make citywide that will um, help um, reduce our energy use rather than adding additional large projects. Um, like you said, you mm -hmm. guys have plenty of those on your plate. Um, I I'm a little disturbed that um, reviewing bills and pump maintenance are um, considered like above and beyond. I think those should be standard operating procedures. Um, we should, I mean, everybody who has a household checks their bills on a regular basis to make sure they're, they're right. <laughs> yeah, we do. Doing that at the city, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and then maintaining our equipment so that it's operating at its maximum capacity is also important. So I do want to speak to that point. Um, you know, by putting this on here, it's not to say that it's not being done. It's just to say this would be a way to kind of monitor and track and verify that and kind of collectively present it to you. So I just wanted to clarify that. Okay. Um, okay. Appreciate that. Yeah, and, and also to clarify, when we get energy bills, they can be incredibly complex because of the number of systems that we have. And so just looking at them, it's not always clear whether they're correct or not. And it actually... Mm -hmm requires to, to really dive into a, a bill for an operation as large as the city with a wastewater plant, a water mm -hmm. plant. A pl uh, it's actually quite a complicated undertaking mm -hmm. to audit a, an energy bill and probably something that we don't have even the expertise to fully grasp. Um, this is, I'm, I'm going to draw a parallel to when you're looking at complex medical bills, like in a hospital, you go to a hospital and all these things happen to you. You have no idea whether the bill is right or not. 
Um, that is why uh, on the HR side of things and the workers' comp side of things, you hire companies to look at the medical bills and to, and to like correct, correct, correct. And it is a standard thing to hire a company to crunch your workers' comp bills. They save you if for every $100, they take a portion because we can't, most doctors can't figure that out. So there's companies who actually specialize in looking at those bills. We have probably like 50, I want to say, yeah. meters every month. Yeah. So it would probably take like some software and some tracking. Yeah, it's a, it's expertise a pretty wouldn't hurt. <laughs> but but to, but to, mm -hmm. I, I'm really excited by the idea of mm -hmm. if, if a firm wants to do this, take a portion of the upside. They do it for free. Mm -hmm. They go in and, and scour it. Um, that's a really positive thing. I like that idea too. Yeah. The idea though of giving half of any savings over is a hard pill to swallow. It's though. for three years. This particular company yeah. that I've been talking to. So it's not forever. Um, but, yeah, and, that, and we don't have to do it. I, 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 there, there is software out there. Um, I could enter our data. I could look at it. You know, it, there. I'm not going to lie. It would be a learning curve for me. Uh, yeah. I, but <laughs> again, I think so, the I would recommend having yeah. a company do it. That's that's. Their I job. would too. Um, I would too. That would be my preference, just because Suzanne's our assistant engineer. And she's designing things for us and doing engineering projects, and that means she can't do that. And um, so, anyway, yeah, that's just my. Opinion. I guess in my mind, I sort of imagined that that would be something that would fall in the finance um, department, not necessarily the engineering department. Wait, no. Okay. All right. So then, the other thing that I wanted to say is, I think that um, as far as an energy management plan. If we really are going to go after small, achievable things that can be done citywide, if we are going to make some kind of procedural list of how we approach things for, for citywide energy savings, then there should be other things in here like how we decide to purchase vehicles, whether we're looking at mileage or hybrid, um, what kind of roofing options we do. When we look at replacing a roof on City Hall, are we looking for things that are reflective and we can heat away from our building? Do we have a landscape plan so that we say we're planting trees to reduce heat load on buildings? If we are going to update roofs, are we putting in solar tubes so that we can get daylight, natural daylight, instead of having to use lights? I mean, these are kinds of things that you work into a plan. It's not something that you have to enact each of those things right now, but whenever decisions are going to be made, city staff has something to look at to say these are things, these are things that we should be looking at to help reduce our energy usage. Mm -hmm. So I think... I think it comes down to a matter of um, setting an example for our community and looking at managing our resources well. And those are the kinds of things I would like to see in an energy management plan. Okay. A lot of those things are often called sustainability plans, by the way. Okay. So maybe we can expand that. You know, an idea is to expand that and say an energy and sustainability plan. That's sort of a... Yeah. Supreme. I just want to say thank you for the time that you put into this. Um, I know that we have lots of lots of goals that we set, um, and I I wasn't a, I didn't feel as though this was one of the top priorities. Mm -hmm. I, uh, as I recall, that it was something that we gave direction that that maybe at a meeting that we would like to see. And I felt with the direction that you were given, you supplied <laughs> what was asked. But Greta brings up some very, uh, very good points about things that we do need. But I think that we need to keep this in mind. And when we're talking about the budget, then we should revisit this idea because it wouldn't be fair to give direction for you to do more without an expectation that we need to have uh, the funds allocated to get the job done. Yeah, or I have been presented with a presentation from another company with the details of what they can offer us. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, this is a starting point, and so it's good to get, get your feedback. <laughs> and um, I think, I mean, my thought, based on what you two have just said, is, you know, um, though that type of kind of, like, broader plan um, for future implementation and projects, it would be involved more than just me. <laughs> Yeah. Essentially, right? There would be planning and, and finance, perhaps, or building. I'm not really sure. Well, but. For example, if we set 
one thing we could do is set sustainability goals or guidelines. And therefore, if we set those guidelines and, and gave people, our staff members, when they do things, for, for example, in the procurement process, um, if there's a sustainable option, that that would be uh, given weight. And so that would sort of be an automatic thing. And so it doesn't necessarily involve any staff time at all, except we just have the goal and we implement that goal. And so that would be a, a really nice way of doing this also, is developing these sustainability goals. Right. For, so all the staff mm -hmm. can follow that. And, yes, staff-wide, department-wide. Department-wide, it's like, oh, there's a sustainable option, we're going to choose that. And that council has sort of blessed that as, a, as an option. Who would take the lead on something like that? Um, I think your office would probably help with the plan. Well, planning is slammed. Everybody's slammed. Um, yeah. Just developing some sustainability goals, we could probably see what other cities have done because that's not a, that's that's a fairly I've seen it before and, and, and we could do not have to reinvent that wheel. <laughs> and Stephanie, could that also be kind of like I'm not saying it has to be in the budget as numbers, but maybe like a preamble in our budget? Yes, that, exactly. You know, exactly. When we make decisions, we look at this. That way, if we did choose to take the ten dollar more option, but because in the long term it saves us money, etc. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, when when we choose thermostats, we choose energy energy efficient thermostats. When we choose light switches, they're the kind that turn off automatically when you leave the room, um, so that we have some principles to guide us when we do our work. And that and that involves them every day. We don't have to uh, set aside staff time to do that. Right. Okay. Well, I agree with um, Sabrina's comments, but I also think that that should not preclude some larger projects if they are, in fact, going to save us money. Uh, because I noticed, for example, that the wastewater treatment plant costs about $180,000 a year for the electricity. That's a big chunk of money. And a few years back, about five years ago, I was part of an ad hoc committee and we looked into um, the possibility of a solar um, solarization of that. And it actually, at that time, and there's, you know, there's undoubtedly potential obstacles. It wasn't a, a finished product, but the uh, estimates that we had from a pretty reputable um, local outfit at that time was that we could solarize and it would not cost us anything extra for the first several years it would be you know zero impact but after a few years and i forget the exact number but maybe after four or five years we start saving more and more and more money uh, even paying back a, a large loan to do it and you know and i realize that's a big project and you have, you have your hands full but if if we need to um contract out to get something like like that done and the savings pay for it that's what I think we should be looking at that as well the small uh, the smaller doable actions yes lowering fruit changing our um, kind of uh, cultural uh, awareness of, of energy conservation and, and what those choices are that those are all really good things and I think this is a really good start um, but I was a little um, concerned that we didn't really even begin to look at um, potential capital improvements until the third year, or actually until the fifth year. So I'm thinking, well, gosh, 180000 a year, why don't we look at that sooner? Mm -hmm. um, I'm really, I like to look at very specific, well, and also, I asked the question, um, we don't even really know what the energy use is compare in comparison between our different facilities when we have all these different meters we don't know how much does this building use how much does the water plant use how much does the sewage treatment plant use in a kind of a digestible format because what we get is these enormous bills that mm -hmm. are very difficult to read so i think that, that yeah starting with auditing and yeah and i think the audits finding help out us <laughs> what our status quo is, and then identifying places where we can start saving even um, incrementally. I think it's all good. Um, but, but I do think this is a high priority um, because I think it is, it costs the city a lot in cash. It also costs our environment. Um, and we're way behind on addressing 
um, trying to reduce global greenhouse gases and use of fossil fuels and electricity uses and all that stuff. So, you know, I think this is, we want to be a leader, I think, and um, be ahead of the curve. We used to be known as the solar capital <laughs> of the world, or of the United States or whatever. Um, we have a lot of resources and a lot of enthusiasm here. So I want us to be a, a leader in energy conservation, just the minimum. So. Larry, did you want to speak? No. <clears throat> you know, I, I'll just end it with, I, I don't want to bog you down. My opinion is I don't want to bog you down with a lot of stuff. I like the idea of the free energy audits and that the, I think the conversation needs to continue, mm -hmm. whether it be in part of the budget or whether it be kind of a preamble as far as we're doing. I agree with Sabrina that, um, actually I looked at the initial one. I, honestly, your numbers, uh, I'm not as much a number person as much as I just, I kept thinking how much and what aren't you going to do if you're doing some of this, is what I was thinking when I read all this. That's what I was thinking. And, and since <laughs> That's what I was our, thinking as I was writing it. <laughs> but, and I'll tell you, I mean, when I drive by and I see you guys out there wearing your little vests and where we've got things happening, um, I'm not saying it's not important, Madge, but I'm, I'm just saying that we, I think I was a part of a conversation the other day where they talked about how do you eat an elephant and you, you don't do it all at once. You, you start off by eating a little yeah. bit. And I think that this is an elephant that we, we take some small bites out of and move forward. Mm -hmm. And as a city, we look at it in the budget and we look at things. And, and if there is a consultant in there, I just want to make sure that we don't jump into something. We think we're saving money. And yeah. in the end, we get burned. Because yeah. we've, we've also been on the receiving end of the we're saving money, but then all of a sudden we... We, we, we hitched our, uh, our yeah. ride to the wrong one, and I, and I, I, I know. guess... I and that's, what the, what, that's where the five years came from, solar match. <laughs> yeah. So I guess I would so, want to yeah. take a deep breath, go, this is what we can do this year, yeah. this is what we can do, with always with the target of moving forward, and as we look to buy things, uh, what I've noticed over the years is that, that things are becoming either more available, as they become more in vogue, prices on some things come down, and... All of a sudden, what would look like something that uh, looked like a, a cosmetic, maybe nice to do thing, now all of a sudden is just standard way of operating. And th to the extent that we can implement those things, that's good. That, are, that is good for the environment and also good for our bottom line. I'm, I'm for it. Mm -hmm. But I also don't want to monopolize all your time, mm -hmm. unless you found a grant that's not only going to pay for your salary but for somebody to come do some of this. Then, so that we can do that. Then, you... then absent that. Um, I think we need to eat this elephant one piece at a time. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, looking for consultants to do audits, I think that's a good step. I think that I'm not sure now where you are collectively <laughs> <laughs> about the billing and, and and hiring a consultant. I'd I, be curious for a separate presentation down the road. I, I really mean, like the idea of, of seeing what somebody else can, can do for that. Just, yeah. I, I mean, I, anything that we can look at to save money, and whereas, as opposed to, again, trying to eat that whole elephant at once, if you come back and say, hey, I've looked at a couple firms, and obviously I, I know how that could be. That could be a couple hours today and a couple hours a couple weeks from now, then all of a sudden you come back to us in a future date and say, here's some options, and they're willing to come talk to you guys, then I'd be willing to entertain that because it's something that isn't going to take up all your time um, and something that's doable. And, and again, I, I, I know I hate giving people some of our money, but if, if it's something you can sit there and watch them do it, and maybe in the future now we're, we're doing it ourselves, then... So be it, and maybe, but I also, also hate being taken for a ride for like 10 years from some entity that, and um, that way if we can recoup some of what we're losing, even if we had to pay somebody part of, you know, three years worth of splitting, splitting the savings, then I'd, I'd be for it as long as moving forward after those three years, we're not stuck. Yeah. Just to reiterate that, um, as Stephanie said, we're not reinventing the wheel. The other cities and jurisdictions have done similar things and we should benefit from their experience and locate 
the kinds of help or contract out with people that have a, re a good reputation, are experts at this, and hopefully don't cost us too much of the uh, whatever the benefits are from it. But I, I agree with you. I'd like to have that brought back um, because I think that's a good place to start because we really need to identify. Um, you know, we need to get the data like a baseline. Here, here's right. where we are now, and and look at the places where we might be in fact already overpaying or you know, build erroneously. erroneously. I think that we have pretty much maxed out all the people and all the time that we can have as a city. And I also think that maybe a good place to start would be to check the building that you mentioned that to kind of figure it out. You've started it and then there's a, a group of people that can come in and help you with it. That may be a, a good place to start uh, just to understand that. Um, but I really think that we're pretty much maxed out and we have projects that are going to be going for the next five or six years that are going to really be pretty good sized projects and uh, our staff is not going to be able to handle all that and so, or this is my estimation on it anyhow and uh, so I think we ought to tiptoe through this personally. So I would be happy to see us um, initiate the free energy audits within the next 12 months and I would also be uh, pleased to see us put together some kind of an energy efficient guideline for citywide departments to be using for their upcoming decisions over the next five to six years regarding all of these projects that we already have going um, and then putting a pin in the rest of it until we can collectively agree on what the right course of action is. I'd agree. Um, and in terms of some guidelines, I, you know, I've sort of been involved in sustainability plans, especially in Texas. Believe it or not, they care about that. <laughs> but uh, with Texas Parks and Wildlife, and I think that we could actually come up with the, very easily some sustainability goals. I mean, simple things like, um, you know, when we buy paper, it's recycled. It's re we use recycled material. Um, things like that. There are already lists things that we can do and I can help with that and that's certainly something I'd like to help you with. And I think by doing that, by, by slowly changing the culture citywide to be regularly considering uh, sustainability and all the decision making, then that leads us down the road much closer to, you know, solar plants and becoming leaders in the larger community. Mm -hmm. And just changing the practices, like, I'm on a no straw kick and, you know, and <laughs> bringing that to, to, to the rest of the city and not buying straws anymore, things like that. So Susanna, do you have, at least from us? Uh, I think so, I just <laughs> want to quadruple check. <laughs> I, I think, I think, we, I think we're, we're good. I think what we might want to do is sort of reshape this and come back to you with like, how does this look? Yeah. And maybe we'll, we'll do that. Do I have anybody from the public that would like to speak on to this? Close the chapter for at least for tonight on this. Okay, thank Good. you, Suzanne. Okay. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank, thank you. you. So, Karen, I think you're up next. Yeah. <clears throat> Karen Stevenson, HR Department. Um, before you have a request for approval for a new job classification for construction specialist and amend the master classification and compensation schedule to include the construction specialist to be effective July 1st. And this position was negotiated during bargaining, um, and it's uh, basically going to be in the public works department. It is a journeyman level, um, and we actually have two folks that are currently doing the tasks and responsibilities. They're just not getting paid, they're working on the pass. And so uh, what the union and uh, the city negotiated was to um, still have the entry level as um, the public works maintenance worker one, and then with a two, they have to obtain some certification from the water department because it makes them more valuable. And then what we would like to do at the two level is to allow them to split off either to the construction specialist or to the maintenance worker three. So they will be at the same price, uh, same salary, um, which is 59C at 
56104, top step, debt 480669. Um, I think it's a, a great retention tool. Public Works is currently one of the lowest departments um, in the pay rate. Uh, they work very hard, they're very diligent, and it allows us the ability to um, utilize them more effectively. And, and the title that we've chosen gives them more flexibility in the jobs that they would be doing. When you would start a new step, so then they would work their way through the ladder? Well, what they or? do is they um, they would go up 5% or, or above where they currently are. So if, they're, if they are currently a, 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 a top step at a, a work or two, then it would obviously the next step, the next um, uh, classification is higher. So we'd look to get the 5% above the current top step. Sometimes it's a little more than 5%, but usually it's right around there. And then they would start that new And then they would start that next level, but okay. yes. Mm -hmm. So not it wouldn't all be the big hit all at once? Then. No. No, not at all. It'll take it'll take a while for them. We currently have two two like I said two people that we would have to grandfather into those positions um, because they're currently doing the work, um, and that would leave us with two uh, construction specialists, and then we would have two uh, uh, public workers, uh, maintenance worker twos, and one is currently working on his third. So, does anybody have any questions, Karen? Does anybody in the public have any questions? Okay. Perfect. Make a motion for the staff recommendation. Do I have a motion? Second. Motion to second. Any further discussion? Nothing for the public? All right. Call for the vote. Councilmember Cohn? Yes. Rodriguez? Yes. Strong? Yes. Strong? Yes. yes. Mayor Gonzalez? Yes. And this is, remember, this isn't just for that, it's also for the classification schedule. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Karen. All right. So now we are at City Council Committee Boards and Agency Reports. Do we have any? Uh, yes. Oh. Oh. Would you want to go first? I'll let you go first, Karen. I'll work my way this way. <laughs> okay. Um, so MTA, I wasn't here at the last City Council meeting. I was stuck in a snowstorm at Denver, Colorado, and I heard that there were some folks here that came to the meeting. Um, as soon as I got back, I met with us, um, the individuals that lived in the neighborhood. I met with city staff. Uh, we had an MTA meeting today at 1.30 in Ukiah, and we discussed uh, that matter as well. Um, so, as you know, we're looking for some solutions. But the thing I really want to uh, talk to you about tonight is that uh, MTA, um, is busy trying. Uh, we have a goal set that in uh, three to five years that we're going to be replacing uh, seven vehicles out of the fleet. Uh, two cutaways, one 35-foot bus, and four dial-a-rides in Mendocino County and converting them over to electric buses, electric vehicles, which is wonderful. And uh, I asked how much of the, what percentage of that fleet it is, and so it's about 10% of uh, of the fleet will be zero emissions, which I think is is absolutely wonderful, and that is a high priority for for MTA. And uh, so, just wanted to share that. The rest of it was just routine budgets and things those, of that nature. Match. Okay. Um, so um, EDFC, the Economic Development Financing Corporation, met on March 14th, um, and they're continuing to um, deal with tightening up the, the review and guidelines and process for loans, and they have a lot of money to loan, so if there's any um, businesses out there that want to take advantage of that possibility, you have to have already um, sought a bank loan and been turned down. But if, if you're in that position, if you're a new startup or weren't able to qualify for a bank loan, you're a perfect candidate to um, look to EDFC. Um, they're doing a lot of outreach um, marketing on that. Um, Imagine if someone were inclined to contact EDFC. I know their officers are in Ukiah. That would be where they would get yes. all of them. Yeah. And they have a website, edfc.org. I'm pretty sure it's an, 
It's actually a not-for-profit uh, organization, and most of the money is federal money, and it's a revolving fund. So as they loan out money and get paid back, then they have more money to, to loan out, and there are some grants as, as well. Um, so EDFC continues to do a lot of uh, housekeeping, and, and they just hired a new part-time uh, office assistant. Um, the MSWA, which is Mendocino Solid Waste Management Authority, which is a uh, joint powers of all the different jurisdictions in our county dealing with solid waste, and it's also known familiarly as Mendo Recycle. Um, they met on March 21st. We're, uh, that organization is, is going through some um, reassessment of things because uh, we haven't been able to fill the general manager position for quite a few months now. And there's also been some changes of personnel from different jurisdictions on the board of MSWA. Um, at the most recent meeting, um, the new representative from the city of Fort Bragg volunteered Fort Bragg to help do a re another recruitment, a little more effort to see if we could find a general manager. Um, absent general manager, the other option seems to be to privatize a good deal of the actual work of household hazardous waste collection and treatment and all of that that MSWA has in the past done. Um, I am very reluctant to give up the, the public oversight of what MSWA does. Um, the privatizing would still leave some gaps of things that the private company really isn't suitable to do. And so we're, we're just in this transition where we don't quite know how it's all gonna fall, uh, fall together or apart. Uh, the county is also reassessing their commitment to uh, the position that was the general manager because the county uh, shared a lot of those costs. So it's an interesting time to be on the MSWA board. Um, Madge? Yes. What about the Coal Creek? Would that be affected by if they went to a private size? No. A Cold Creek has separate contracts with all of the haulers now, either with the haulers or with the jurisdictions, and all of them, like we did last meeting, have now approved the new tipping fee, and um, and they have pretty long-term contracts, so it doesn't really um, affect Cold Creek one way or the other. Thank you. Um, and then the final thing that I'm also newly, relatively newly, was appointed as the substitute or the alternate for the Sonoma Clean Power Board, and that is now the provider of electricity for about 87% of all of our electric use in um, you know, in the city of Valencia, but also in the county. Uh, the only exception is Ukiah because they have their own electric, um, the, the city of Ukiah provides the electricity. Um, but everybody else pretty much has opted into Sonoma Clean Power unless they went to the trouble to opt out. And um, so I am going to be the alternate at the next Sonoma Clean Power meeting, which is next Thursday. Um, Sonoma Clean Power, I'm, I'm gonna just segue right now because it happens to be they're gonna be presenting to the energy forum that Well is sponsoring tomorrow evening. So people um, who are paying their electric bills, it's from PG&E, but the electricity is coming from Sonoma Clean Power. If you want to find out where it's coming from and what they're doing to try to um, reduce uh, greenhouse gases and how that affects you as a ratepayer, um, come tomorrow night at 7 o'clock to the Willits Hub. But I will also be reporting at the next meeting from the Sonoma Clean Power Board. Um, they're, they're dealing, it's, it's a big um, responsibility really because they're, they're providing the electricity for Sonoma and Mendocino counties, um, and they are really trying to, again, it's a public entity, not a private company. Uh, so they're not profit driven, they're trying to give us the best deal and the best deal for the environment at the same time. So I'm really, uh, I'm really pleased to be part of that. Madge, yeah. have they discussed it all at this with the PG&E saying that if during the fire season that they would turn off the power, how does that affect? 
Yes. I, I did not go to the most recent previous meeting of Sonoma Clean Power. Um, it, it didn't come up at the first meeting I went to, um, and I don't know if it comes up, um, if it will come up next week at that meeting. But I will, I will find, I'll ask about that. Yeah. Um, they did discuss the sort of the outfall of PG&E declaring bankruptcy, and it's going to take at least a year to figure out what that means. Um, but Sonoma Clean Power is very much involved in the negotiations around what happens as PG&E um, divests or declares bankruptcy or, or whatever they, how, it, I know that their lawyers are looking at it really closely. Okay, thank you. Madge, today uh, Supervisor Jardy and I were talking about solar power and the conversation was if you're producing solar in uh, the area where Sonoma Clean Power for example, in our area, where you are producing more than you're using, is PG&E benefiting or is Sonoma Clean Power benefiting because the invoice has PG&E on it, but we all know that we get billed from Sonoma Power too. And does, does a household member or business need to call and specify that their excess is going to Sonoma Clean Power or PG&E? Or do you know the answer? I am pretty sure, but I, oh, I, I shouldn't really say that I'm sure. Um, I would guess that it's going to Sonoma Clean Power because they're the supplier of the electricity. PG&E is the delivery system. So it seems like it should be Sonoma seems. Clean Power, but I will, yeah. I will ask that question. I think it's a good question. Larry, did you have anything? Larry, did you have anything? Did you have anything? Oh, OK. Um, I think both Larry and I have meetings on Monday. He's got, uh, I've got LAPCO on Monday, and you've got MCOG on Monday. And, um, and I did not go to the League of Cities Policy Committee meeting, which is meeting right now in uh, Costa Mesa, for obvious reasons. So, <laughs> so I, uh, I'll let you guys know at the next meeting about LAPCO. So, all right. And who pays for uh, Council member reports and recommendations. Does anybody have anything? Good and well oh, here. I just want to repeat this, that the uh, tomorrow night is this um, energy forum. And in addition to Sonoma Clean Power, we have several of our local wonderful experts like Keith Rutledge and Michael Hackleman, Apperson Energy. Uh, John Haschek's going to talk about the county level stuff. And um, so that should be a kind of a, an exciting meeting of uh, lots of different expertise. And then also, um, well as co-sponsoring, but um, Claudia Benning is organizing this wonderful health summit on April 6th. It's a Saturday and it's a daytime, 11 to 5 at the Grange. So there will be a lot of um, resources about how to keep healthy if you want more information about that. Any other good welfare? All right. Well, we have... Uh one, two, three, four items on our closed session notice. Conference with legal counsel pursuant anticipated litigation two cases. Conference with legal counsel pursuant government code 54956.9, existing litigation, Jeanette Brown versus City of Willits. And conference with legal counsel pursuant government code, existing litigation, Neuroth versus the County of Mendocino. And item D, pursuant government code, labor negotiations, city manager, and chief of police. So. We'll report out if we have something to report out.